Americans visit the library more often than they go to a movie theater or attend a sporting event. And coming up on a Humankind special, we explore how libraries are adapting to the shifting social conditions of their patrons. We see over 2,500 people a day through our doors. Um, so whatever's happening outside the library, I always say, is probably happening inside the library. We're serious about being a public library. The Denver Public Library employs social workers who help guide people in trouble to agencies where they can get help. Also, we consider how public libraries have quietly revolutionized their mission. Today, they provide not just books and periodicals, but the panoply of resources available in the digital age. And young people in particular are responding. I'm David Freudberg. Stay with us for Libraries Reimagined from Humankind. Humankind is produced in association with WGBH Boston and Documentary Educational Resources. This special project is supported by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation and by the Humankind Program Fund. You're listening to Libraries Reimagined from Humankind. I'm David Freudberg. This is going to sound strange, but the most romantic place you can possibly be is at a library on a Friday night when it's closing. It, the ambiance in that library and the echoes of everything that happened during the week in, the, in that library just seems to come alive. And the memory lights up in your head as you lock in that door on a Friday evening. This is Richard Ashby, Jr., director of the Stowe Rocks Public Library in the town of McKees Rocks, Pennsylvania, outside Pittsburgh. He's a true believer in libraries as a free, open-to-all institution in every community. And today's libraries are percolating with change, driven by the tide of technology which has transformed so much of how we access and use information, but also by the urgent need to preserve the norms of civility which find a sanctuary at the library. Richard Ashby tuned into this role at his first library job. It was a brand new library in a small hamlet on Long Island. I started out as a security guard and I was promoted to the custodian, if that's a promotion. And um, I worked as assistant librarian for the children's section, then I worked in the, I helped develop the teen section, then I sat behind the reference desk, and I didn't have a librarian's degree. That deficit became a barrier to further advancement. So with tuition help from a community development organization and a church, Richard went on to earn his master's in library science. I absolutely love libraries now. I cannot go on a vacation without visiting the libraries in the different communities that I go to. I cannot drive down the street of a community that I've never been to without stopping into the library. In some towns, the local library is the only indoor public space where everyone is allowed. You can stay hours at a time, no questions asked. But the library is no longer just stacks of books and periodicals or CDs and DVDs. The fixtures there now include banks of computers that extend the library's walls to the outer reaches of the Internet, which means a revolution in how libraries serve their patrons. But at core, this remarkable local institution remains a repository of learning and literature in its many forms. It's just the culture of a library. It's just the, the fact that I can walk into some place and that it is full of knowledge. I can get lost in a book. You can get lost in a, in a, on the computer. You can get lost in a children's story hour hearing a story. And Richard Ashby, along with many colleagues at America's 120,000 libraries, have come to regard their job as a calling, an opportunity to help people locate the resources and develop the skills to lead more fulfilling lives. It is a profession with a high degree of satisfaction. It is a, it is a profession with a high degree of sadness. Sometimes you see, you see someone walk into the li library and you just your heart breaks. A, a lady was in the library this week, um, Monday, 
and she was at the computer, and she had been there three t- three days last week, and I never really paid her much attention. And Monday, I went over and was talking to the lady, and she was crying, little crying. And I said, what is the problem? She said that the car dealership down the street from the library had closed, and they closed all of a sudden, and that she was out of a job. And she had worked there for 15 years at eight seventy-five an hour. She was trying to find a new job, and she was frustrated, and she was crying, and she kept saying that, she couldn't get the computer to work. And um, one of the staff members was, was not giving her the proper service. And I was a little frustrated. It turns out that the, um, one of the keys was getting stuck and she couldn't maneuver, the, maneuver it right. So anyway, we, we sat, so I told the staff member, you sit down with the lady and you fill out the applications that she needs to be filled out. You stay with her until she's satisfied. And she did. And it took about 45 minutes, but the lady got up and she started crying again. And she said, well, you know, I, I, I'm sorry I was so much trouble. Um, I, thank you, I thank you for your help, and I thank the staff for their help. And I said, no need to cry. Um, that's our job. Our job is to help you. And I want to apologize if you, for, if you didn't feel like you were getting the service that you needed or deserved earlier. But these are some of the th- things that happened. Not long ago, some observers predicted that the cornucopia of information available online would sap libraries of their vitality. In particular, young people might not show up. But as it turns out, digital natives who've grown up with this technology are the most likely generation of Americans to visit the library building and to access it online. Elizabeth LaRosi directs the Turner Free Library in Randolph, Massachusetts, near Boston, where upstairs, a young adult space along with the Turner Free Studio are a magnet for kids. We have maybe 60 to 70 teenagers come every single day after school to spend time in the library. Our second floor is our main level. We've got our computers and we have all of our adult um, materials as well as a quiet room for those who still feel that a library needs to have a quiet space. We have one of those. Now, is that a controversy, whether a library needs a quiet space? I think it's a controversy in many towns, but less so here. Our library is more like a community center, and people come here to have meetings. People come here to talk to each other, to collaborate on projects. If they do need a quiet space, we do have it. And if it does get filled up, we do offer um, earplugs. (laughs) That's a portable quiet space. Yes. For many residents of Randolph, which is ranked the most racially diverse town in the state, using the library is woven into their everyday lives. A regular patron, Lori McDermott, operates the local garden center. When my children were little, I think back then we didn't really have a lot of money and coming here, taking out books um, was just a huge part of our week and I think helped shape who they are, you know, just reading. Did any of them become voracious readers? They both are. I mean, we would take out 10 to 15 books, and I would have to keep track of them all. You know, they would fall behind a desk, and, you know, going back to get more, we would have to make sure we had every one. Um, I think that was a big part of kind of helping them be responsible. go to the mall, it's expected that you'll spend money. You go to a coffee shop, it's expected that you'll buy coffee. So you can come here and you can spend all day using the Wi-Fi, using the computers. It's truly one of the the last places where community can come together with no expectation. It's a nice thing. As a public venue, libraries are not immune from the turbulence of American society. And this includes library patrons who struggle with the opioid epidemic. It's an uncomfortable reality that some people experience a drug overdose while at the library. This has happened often enough that some libraries formally prepare for it. 
We have done a lot of training for our staff around how to respond to this. It's really incredible to see my colleagues snap into action. Elissa Hardy holds the unusual position of social worker at the Denver Public Library. When someone ODs on the premises, they've developed protocols for rapid response, which include administering Narcan nasal spray, an emergency medical antidote. We have someone who is performing the life-saving measures. We have another person calling 911. We have another person directing human traffic away from the scene. Um, we have someone at the door waiting for paramedics to get them up here when they arrive. It's We've, we've nailed this down. <laughs> I'm just really grateful that we are able to reverse overdoses here at the library. As of today, in the last two and a half years, we've reversed 28. And that means there are 28 people that walked out of here alive. What's it like for you to be present when a overdose is reversed through Narcan? Yeah. I mean, I'll be really honest, it's actually really kind of hard to talk about it because I feel really emotional about it. It's that impactful um, because you're afraid that the person will not wake up. Um, and when they do, it's a good thing. We see over 2,500 people a day through our doors. Um, so whatever's happening outside the library, I always say, is probably happening inside the library. We're serious about being a public library. Rachel Fuel is the administrator of the Denver Central Library in the heart of downtown. When we see all those people, you see just a wide variety of needs. But as our social work team has been able to get out to our other locations throughout the city and approaching our customers in a little bit of a different way and, and kind of digging in a little bit with staff to find out, like, well, what's going on? People are complaining that um, there are people parked in, in your parking lot while we're closed. What's going on there? Well, the social workers are able to then walk around and go talk to those folks who are in their cars and find out some of them are experiencing homelessness and they're using our Wi-Fi when we're closed so that their kids can get their homework done. The social work staff, as well as librarians, are trained to listen carefully. Many people in difficult circumstances lack the information to understand which resources are available. And when we invite them in, we discover more of their story um, to hear that, you know, they're here because they don't have anywhere else to go, and the only shelter they have is their vehicle. Um, and so our, our social workers are just working then to connect those folks to the resources that are available throughout the city, um, to library resources, inviting them in. You're welcome here in our building. Does this affect whether people are comfortable here in the library, the users who are not dealing with these issues? So I'd say the library is a really unique place because it's one of the only places, maybe the only place, that anyone can show up with whatever they've got going on in their life, whether they're housed or unhoused, whether they have a job or not, um, wherever they are in their life situation. And in so many cases in our society today, we can opt out of looking at people who are different from us, from being in a space where someone is different from us. So I think the library is a really cool and unique place that we can have this dynamic of people encountering um, others who aren't on the same path that you are on. And that can make people feel uncomfortable. I have, think. have you heard that from oh, yeah. customers here? Yeah, I have. Um, and, and we've heard also that people intentionally try to visit our, our downtown location because they understand that there is a huge gulf in the haves and have-nots in Denver. And so if you can put yourself in a place where you see that this is what's happening in our city and you're thinking about why is this happening and what can I do to make a change there? What can I do to share with my kids that this is a reality of life? But that sits well for some people, and it sits very uncomfortably for others. Thank you so much for your willingness. Here, David, there's a chair for you. Thank you very much. I'm David. All right, Tim. How are you doing today? Sick. Sorry about that. It's OK. Uh, I understand that you're a regular user of the library here? Yes. 
And uh, what services do you take part in here? Well, I put in my job applications on Craigslist. So that's, that's about it right there. And maybe if they can help me, like a bus pass every now and then. And is that uh, for one day, or how does that work? It all depends on if they have any, because there's different people with different reasons and everything. They try to share them. So when you go on Craigslist and send in job applications, what kind of work are you looking for? I work hospitality. So is that like hotels and restaurants? Uh, restaurants mainly, or some motels, all depends what they have. So uh, are you currently unemployed? Yes, yes, until I get my new uh, identification card. That'll be this week. And that's identification for what? Uh, state ID. I see. Colorado. Because if you don't have a driver's license, you don't have ID. Yeah, well, that even of... just an ID just shows who you are. Mine expired a few months ago when I got hit by the bus. You got hit by a bus? Yeah, I was across the street, wasn't paying attention, got hit by a city bus. Yeah, sorry to hear that that happened to you. Yeah, it still hurts, but I'm just going to keep my head up and move forward. Right. Um, May I ask, where did you sleep last night? I slept in Dagon Alley. Although I don't want to admit it, but I did. You slept in an alley? You know. So, no uh, human being should have to go through that. Yeah. No. So how many hours a day would you say you're online here? Uh, maybe two hours a day. Mm -hmm. Maybe 15, 20 minutes here. Come back a few hours, 15, 20 minutes. It's actually a big, beautiful building, and there's plenty of room for everybody. Michelle Jeske is Denver's city librarian. She serves as chief of staff for all 26 libraries in the system. We spoke at her office in the central branch. Um, and it's actually one of the joys of my life to work in a place that is so inclusive and welcoming to everybody. I love walking around and seeing every kind of person that exists on this planet in our library buildings. Um, but I think there is a reality that is not as comfortable a place for some people. And it's not the library of people's childhood memories in a lot of cases, for a lot of reasons. It's not just about this. Like, it's libraries aren't quiet anymore, typically. And um, we're doing all sorts of, you know, programs and services that wouldn't be experiences that we had as kids. So I, I feel like it's part of a larger, um, conversation about what a public library today does for its community. We're examining the evolution of public libraries to modern learning centers and community hubs free Wi-Fi, training in computer skills, and special services for patrons of all ages. You're listening to Humankind. I'm David Freudberg. For more information on this segment, part of Libraries Reimagined, and to obtain audio downloads or CDs, please visit humanmedia.org. We have much better connections now than we did then, but 20 years ago, you know, people, if they had it, they had dial-up. Lara Clark in Chicago is Deputy Director for Information Technology Policy at the American Library Association, which helps to strengthen library staff and services throughout the United States. Libraries have been on a steady march to bring in all of this technology and make it freely available to people. We have human intermediaries that are experts in information access who are also there to help people learn. But the dizzying advance of the information age has left many Americans behind. The digital divide, although it's narrowing, remains real among many low-income and rural citizens. A report in 2017 showed that about a fourth of us lack Internet at home. You have to have the access to the devices and to the Internet itself. But in, for so many people, they also need somebody to help them learn. I was in a library once, and uh, I was talking to a librarian doing research, and uh, she said, people come into the library and they will take the mouse and they will point it at the screen because that's what their familiarity was. And so every day, librarians across the country are helping people 
come online many times for the first time. And even more importantly, the technology changes every day, every week, and librarians are working to keep up with that like we all are and to make it possible for people to catch up in the digital age. Yes, it was important to get people online to learn how to do things online. But today, if you want to apply for a job, the only place to apply for a job is online. Use of the Internet, says librarian Brian Bannon, is now practically a survival skill in the modern age. If you want to apply for benefits, the only place to apply for benefits is online. I mean, really, if you anything, just about anything you want to do now, there isn't a paper option or very few paper options. Um, and so the skill set to do it and the access to do it is even more critical today. In 2019, Brian was appointed director of the New York Public Library. He also serves as president of the Digital Public Library of America. I was a, a child who actually struggled to learning to read and, and write. I'm dyslexic. And so um, the library for me um, was was actually an unlikely place uh, to go after school. And so um, it wasn't a place I necessarily connected with. It was a place that I think um, my family went, my, my sister went. Um, but in some ways, I felt sort of like an outsider looking in. Um, so the dyslexia produced anxiety for you? It did, and I think because um, I didn't uh, reading didn't come easy to me. Um, uh, you know, in contrast, my sister you couldn't get a book out of her hands, and and for me it was it was a lot of work. And so um, you know, libraries for me became analogous to something that was hard for me, and so I was more likely to be seen at a museum or playing sports or doing more active activities or in late, a little bit later in life in theater and some other things that were more experiential in nature. And obviously I learned to read and write like any other kid, but it was just um, the traditional ways were a little more tricky. Um, you know, fast forward actually, um, you know, I got my way through high school and, and, and into college and, and, you know, where I actually came to libraries was actually a, a professor um, of history who was, um, I was doing an independent study with and we were thinking about uh, what I might do as a career and um, we were working on a project looking at uh, social justice movements. And she paused and said, you know, have you thought about co going into libraries? So we, we were having a conversation about intellectual freedom and access to information. And, and she knew I was dyslexic. And I, you know, obviously had, had overcome it and was, you know, doing fine in school and all those things. And, and I, I thought she was joking. Um, and I was like, really? You know, li you know, why would I do library? You know, and she said, you know, she, she really schooled me on what the core mission of what libraries are about and that they exist in the, as these democratic spaces to bring access to information and ideas to people to, cre you know, create a stronger, more democratic society. I mean, it was a really, um, you know, eye-opening moment. And and then I ended up in going to library school and um, and really ended up becoming a librarian. Cool. Did you check if the, all the DVDs are inside? Uh, yeah, I did. So those are returned, correct? Mm -hmm. okay. You're going to check that all in one single card? Yeah. Two separate. Right. Thank you. Local libraries enjoy enormous popularity in America. According to a recent survey, over 90% of Americans view libraries as welcoming and friendly places. And the range of users is astounding. A majority of women, of parents, of 16 to 29-year-olds, of people who hold college degrees, of African Americans, and of those in households earning less than $30,000 per year, all these folks have visited a library in the last year. What's kept me in this field is that is the mission of public libraries is quite a radical one. And, you know, libraries in general, particularly public libraries, and it stems from an idea that Benjamin Franklin came up with over 250 years ago about creating these public spaces that connect people to the ideas of the day to create a stronger, more vibrant, you know, hopefully competitive society. And it was, it was supposed to be a, a physical place of innovation and creativity. And right in the heart of that li library that he opened, which is still a museum today, is where you can see where he did many of his most famous experiments with science and technology. It was a living laboratory of ideas so to speak. And so in some ways, I think that my notion of what a public library was, and, and really in a lot of ways, the public library that I grew up with, really wasn't fulfilling its full potential or mission, even in those days. And I think that the mission um, that we have and, and the work that we do in libraries today is really to fully realize the, the potential. And over that long history, one thing seems to be constant, that libraries retain an extraordinarily high degree of public confidence, 
even in these times of intense polarization in our society. It's libraries and firefighters. If you look at every study, those are the two public service professions that are still remaining with 80-ish percent of the population saying, we value this, we value these people. Librarian Valerie Horton served as longtime director of Minitex, an innovative service for libraries in Minnesota and the Dakotas. I think it goes back to that hyper-local. You know your local librarian. You probably went to school with his children or you shop at the grocery store with her. You know, your librarian is connected into the community. And all of the research shows that we trust the people who we interact with more than people who we have distance from. Plus, you just cannot talk to a librarian or a library employee who is not passionate about the ability to transform lives. I mean, literally, when we go to conferences, we, we share beers and we talk about how we impacted someone's lives. I think it's because we've stayed true to our mission and our vision for the whole history of public libraries. Michelle Jeske is the city librarian of Denver. How we do that has changed, but the actual core of being about democracy and being about free and equal access for everyone is at the heart of every decision that we make. And as long as we stay true to that, I think we're going to remain trusted. We're not, you know, flipping around like and trying to, you know, figure out where we're going and what we need to do to get there, I think. We're pretty laser focused on providing everyone in the community these opportunities to thrive. Coming up, the role of public libraries in helping to preserve our basic right to ask questions and learn knowledge. And we hear the inspiring story of the sidewalk librarian. Humankind continues in a moment. You're listening to Libraries Reimagined from Humankind. I'm David Freudberg. librarian ask you, why do you want this? Right? Their job isn't to ask you why. Their job is to say, how can I help you? And for library users, says Eric Kleinenberg, understanding the role of librarian as someone who helps you to locate resources without judging is often a relationship established at a young age. For so many people, the first moment of life where you get a card of identification that is yours, that recognizes you as an individual with responsibility and a mind of your own, is when you get your library card. Eric is professor of sociology at New York University. For his book, Palaces for the People, he's studied how we use public institutions. I watched so many children get their first library cards. I saw them there with their mothers or fathers. I saw the, the, the feeling of pride uh, express itself on the face of everybody in the room, you know, from the, the person making the card to the parents to the child, you know, herself. I watched them experience the kind of power and wonder of, of, of being recognized in that way and then of taking out a book. But it's not your book that you own and can do anything with. It's now a book that you are going to borrow and you have to take care of it and return it because one of the first things you learn when you go to a library and get your card is that there are other children who also would like that book and your job is to take care of it and to return it promptly so that other people can have it too. Such a basic concept and yet a profound lesson about how we treat each other in our civil society. The American Library Association estimates there are a total of 1.5 billion visits per year at U.S. libraries. These range from the modest lending facility in a remote rural community, where sometimes a single librarian works, to the Library of Congress in Washington, the world's largest. Imagine that the library didn't exist. You know, imagine that we didn't have this concept called the library. 
And you and I had this conversation today, and we came up with it, and we thought, you know, this is a really good thing, this library idea. Why don't you and I walk together to City Hall or the State House or to the White House? Let's go to the White House. Why not? And we say, we've been sitting together, and we've come up with this amazing idea. Uh, we think that the United States should invest in these things we're calling libraries. And what we, uh, what we ask is that uh, the government uh, work with philanthropy to build buildings in every neighborhood, and we'll, you know, we'll call them libraries. Some will be really grand and made of marble, and others will be small houses, um, but we'll have them everywhere. This vision for repositories of knowledge accords with Benjamin Franklin's observations about libraries during colonial times. He wrote in his autobiography that libraries have become a great thing in itself and continually increasing. These libraries have improved the general conversation of Americans. So in Eric Kleinenberg's proposal for contemporary libraries... We are going to stock them with uh, our shared cultural heritage, you know, books and music and videos uh, and periodicals, and we will put computers in so people who can't afford computers can have them. We'll program them morning to night uh, with everything from, you know, music classes to book groups to karaoke hours to film nights to current events conversations to English as a second language classes and special classes for people who have just gotten out of prison and need to get jobs. By the way, uh, we want to make sure that everybody in America who just happens to be in America that day uh, is welcome and, and has access to it, so it doesn't matter what your race is or your religion or your social class or your ethnicity. Oh, and one last thing, Mr. President, um, everything there is going to be free. Um, you know, we're going to share, share this on an honor system. Ben Franklin might be proud. Earlier, we heard from folks at the Turner Free Library in the small New England town of Randolph, Massachusetts. The original library there was housed in a granite structure dating to 1874, one of the first libraries in the state. In the new building, residents can be seen peering out tall picture windows seated in comfortable chairs by a small stone pool of flowing water and countless stacks of books. It's a place where people come to study, to work, or just to relax. Why do you use the library? I use it because I love to read. Um, and now, I think, as I'm getting older, I like the quiet spaces. So you can come, and since the renovation, there are like little quiet rooms that you can go into with no televisions, no radios, just, you know, you and a book. There's nothing quite like being in here. It's a real thing, you know, get you out of the house and, and, you know, pass the time with some nice people and find good books that I can't wait to get home and start. And if it's really good, I can't put it down. But I don't worry about it because there's so many more here. If I get a book that I kind of halfway through I don't like and I'm really done with it, not worried, come, come bring it back and get another one. Never-ending supply. I love it. Every Wednesday we have the Student Success Center where some of us graybeards offer homework help to high school kids if they want to have help with any subject. Um, I, was an, I was a nurse for 42 years, but my background is in chemistry and biology, so I'm willing to do any of that. So do you enjoy mentoring or tutoring the kids? Yes, I do. We've got to get this next generation in line and just the whole critical thinking part, not blindly accepting what somebody says, but really think about it. And, you know, if necessary, go back to the books and look it up yourself. The kids stream in from Randolph High, usually around 2 p.m. They're drawn to screens, especially video games and the digital media center, but also to books or doing homework on laptops. Kendall is in 10th grade. I borrow the SAT books and a lot of the test prep books because I want to prepare for that. 
since I'm like a sophomore and I want to like prepare for college. Do you ever borrow fiction books from the library? Sometimes. I usually borrow informational books such as like how to like be positive or like how to manage time like like books like that. I learned how to like focus and stay quiet and really think about myself here. In the library you can't really be that loud and when you're here it's very quiet so you can really think about like how your day went and you can really think about um, just what you want to do. It's like a really relieving place to be. This is Sharon Parrington Wright showing me one of the library's most popular rooms, the Media Center, which houses Turner Free Studio. It's actually quite lovely to walk past it. Uh, depending on what time of day you go by, you might hear singing, you might hear musical instruments, you might hear a podcast in progress. Uh, so just being a bystander, like as I walk from the elevator past, you go, oh, what's going on in there today? And what exactly is made in this room? It varies uh, with the user, so it's as we have a number of options. It's really up to their imagination. But that very, very large iMac also has a lot of very, very expensive software on it. Uh, so if they want to make music, if they want to edit photos, if they want to make videos, people come and they experiment. They try things out, they see what works, they see what doesn't. It's really a, a user-led space. As digital media proliferate across society, these facilities are increasingly common at public libraries. The ability to create and edit original content finds a growing audience here. We have small business owners, we have podcasters, we have pastors coming in to record sermons, we have musicians coming in to work on demo tapes, uh, I use it for YouTube videos, we have a YouTube channel for the library so we edit our videos in here too. Uh, so it's in use constantly. Seniors and other adults come to seek help digitizing photo collections or old videos for posterity. But in after school hours, it's the teenagers who energize the media facilities. And sometimes you'll find the kids teaching their elders about using this technology. It's not just the library is a place where people consume other people's creativity, but they also can express and share their own creativity. They can create. Again, Lara Clark of the American Library Association. And this idea of maker spaces and creation, um, whether that's in the STEM kind of sciences um, and laboratory kinds of things, or it's creative expression. Um, this is something that we're seeing in a lot more libraries. And I think that's very appealing for young people. Like they're the they're the captains of their own journey. And libraries have always done that with reading and encouraging folks to make their own choices. It's not what their parent chooses for them, although their parent should guide that, um, particularly if they're younger. But it's about really encouraging people to make this choice for themselves and to pursue their own passion. We're exploring the longtime mission of our public libraries, as well as recent innovations as information technology continues to evolve. You're listening to Humankind. I'm David Freudberg. For more information on this segment, Libraries Reimagined, to obtain audio downloads or CDs, please visit humanmedia.org. This is the Harold Washington Library Center, a stately red brick downtown building that is the cornerstone of the Chicago Public Library System. The original library, established in 1873, was housed in the old water tower. Back then, inside the tower, they lined the round walls with bookshelves. Today, the new library has 10 floors and is considered one of the world's largest where I met sociologist Eric Kleinenberg. We are sitting here today in an incredible public library solely because you and I have inherited from the generations that came before us an institution born of a principled commitment to uh, 
advance the public good, to fund uh, public institutions with a public-minded mission, because all of us are better off for it, because everyone should be able to make something better of themselves, because we want this to be a country where people can advance and get ahead and do better uh, and study and work hard and be together and participate in thriving, living, uh, democratic, open, accessible institutions. That, that is something that you and I have inherited because generations that came before us, people in red states and blue states, Republicans, Democrats, across the aisle, work together to build institutions like that. And they exist in virtually every single community of the United States, and they are locally run. Absolutely. And we are so lucky. We are so lucky to have inherited that. It's, it's an, our lives are so much better. Our, the cities we live in are better. The communities we live in are better. The suburbs we live in are, are better. Our collective culture is better. The legacy handed down to us by these enduring institutions offers not just the treasures of knowledge housed in their collections and made freely available to the public. Librarians understand it offers to patrons the opportunities that the knowledge unlocks. Librarian Richard Ashby outside Pittsburgh leads the Black Caucus of the American Library Association. My motto is with literacy and justice for all. And I live, and I live by that motto. Help spread literacy. Help spread equality. Help spread equity. Not only within my employees, but within the community and people who walk through that door. You see... They tell you in America, with liberty and justice for all. Oh, that's beautiful. That's one of the most beautiful phrases ever penned. But in reality, it's literacy and justice. Because if you do not have literacy, you're going to receive very little justice. Back when he worked in the Philadelphia area, Richie founded a nonprofit group called Literacy Nation, which promotes basic reading, speaking, and writing skills for youth and adults. Years ago, my wife and I built a library in West Philadelphia, 12 rooms, over 5,000 books. And um, we came to work one morning, and there was a bullet hole in the door of the library. And so she said, listen... There's a bullet hole in the door. You have to pack up the books in the library. We can't stay here. The neighborhood's too bad. Um, I, we can't afford you getting shot in this building while people are outside doing stuff. So I, as I was packing the library and I, I had the stuff on this, moving it out, out of the building, God said, hey, build a library here on the street. That way you can see if there's trouble. So I put the tables on the street, I put the, la the laptops on tables, I put a table of new books, a table for the children, a table of used books for the adults. I made a ready, ready reference section behind me out of milk crates, and I called myself the sidewalk librarian. Richie would arrange the books and laptops on a sidewalk in an inner city neighborhood known for drug dealing. If they can sell poison, he said, I can give away the antidote. And then I started setting up sidewalk librarians all over Philadelphia, did some in Queens, did a sidewalk librarian in Brooklyn, took the act up to Detroit, and I'm known as a sidewalk librarian. I will stand and I will give out books on the sidewalk. I will set up laptops on the sidewalk and do library services from the sidewalk. It wasn't exactly a lending library, more a source of free reading material that need not be returned. As long as you were able to make use of a book, that accomplished Richie's mission. Yes, give it to a cousin, a friend, just give it away. Libraries, unlike pretty much any other institution, are serving cradle to grave. Michelle Jeski, City Librarian of Denver. So you've got all the generations you're trying to serve. You've got all the socioeconomic backgrounds. You've got all the interests and passions and all the things that people come here to explore. And you have people that are having a crisis that day or an ongoing crisis. So that is a lot to have to manage. And yet we feel like all of that is within our mission. So I'm not going to say it's easy, but I do think it's our work. And we don't do it alone. We have had developed some really amazing partnerships 
whether that's helping, you know, make sure that parents and caregivers have what they need to help their little ones, to helping older adults with the struggles that they might be going through, to helping the genealogist, to helping the person who's um, misusing a substance and struggling with that. Um, that's all part of the job. It keeps it very interesting, I would say. <laughs> and, and we're highly relevant, and I think that we will remain so. And there's something about the architectural design, especially of our great libraries, which, while secular institutions, have almost the feeling of a sacred space. You can link to stunning photographs depicting these elegant geometries at our website, humanmedia.org. French photographer Thibault Poirier calls his library series Palaces of Self-Discovery. Their scenes evoking an ambience of contemplation. Sociologist Eric Kleinenberg. I can tell you about so many stories I heard from people who, who discovered something fundamental about themselves in a library, whose lives changed because of the time they spent in a library, who grew more independent, more self-aware. And it's striking to me that our generation today, the, those of us who are on Earth right now, those of us who live in this country right now, haven't stopped often enough to ask what we are leaving to the people who come after us. You know, what are we doing to this institution that we have inherited? How are we making sure it's better for the people who come after us? The famous seventh generation adage among Native Americans. Yeah, exactly right. And I worry about that. And I worry about that every time I walk into a library that um, uh, is neglected. A couple of years back, Forbes magazine published an article by an economics professor at Long Island University proposing that Amazon replace local libraries and, quote, save taxpayers lots of money while enhancing the value of their stock. The article ignited a firestorm of protest by some library patrons and especially by librarians. Within days, Forbes deleted the piece from its website. Perhaps more interesting than the ill-fated proposal was the ardent defense of libraries it elicited. People love that the library belongs to them. Lara Clark of the American Library Association. We buy more copies of books that are popular, but we buy other books too because we want to have a really balanced collection. So our driver is about meeting the needs of our communities, not strictly what's going to sell the most copies. And I think people value that. And we see it and hear it all the time, that that's still important to them. It gets challenging sometimes when budgets are tight. And people are like, oh, what can we do away with? Um, but in every case, I think libraries bring more value um, than the investment that is made into them. And so there's been studies about return on investment, those kinds of things. So for the funds that are invested in library collections, library staff, library buildings, um, the return on that investment is so great. And how is that measured, return on investment in a public library? If you had to pay for this, what would you pay? So that's fairly straightforward, right? Like if I had to buy all the books that I check out, if I had to rent the room instead of getting free access to a meeting room, if I had to buy the CDs and videos, etc. What is, if we add all that up, um, what does that add up to relative to the taxes that I pay? And by and large, it's, you know, in different communities, cities and states have done these kinds of evaluations and they'll see four to one or five to one or six to one. You mentioned cutbacks. Yeah. Libraries are frequent targets when local governments that fund them trim their budgets. What are some of the, the common impacts of that? My greatest experience around those kinds of threats was during the Great Recession. You know, people would say, wait, this is where I come with my kids for early learning. This is how I get my kids ready for school to start before they're even in their K through 12 environment. This is where I go. I have less money myself, so I am checking out more materials. Um, this is where I go to hear a chamber orchestra in their public space for free. I have seen municipalities across the country slash library budgets, you know, at the moment when, from my perspective, the library is most needed. Eric Kleinenberg, author of Palaces for the People. Because if you do have a homeless crisis, the library is going to be a key institution for you. If you do have a health crisis, 
the library is going to be a key institution for you. If you're concerned about how literate and educated young people are, you know, the library is a key institution. If you're concerned about the collapse of, of civil society and trust and community, you know, you better well fund your library. Um, if you're concerned about the state of democracy, if you want make, to make sure people are registered to vote or that people even uh, are counted in the census, those are things the library does really, really well. So I see the library as essential social infrastructure, but I don't think that most city legislatures see it that way. And as a consequence, um, when libraries shut down, they're not open at night, they're not open on the weekends. Um, the, Bathrooms don't work very well, and people who rely on those bathrooms can't use them. Um, they can't register for people to vote. Uh, they can't help people who are recently out of the criminal justice system, out of prison, uh, find a job. They can't promote computer literacy. They can't promote learning English as a second language. They don't have after-school programs for teenagers. The teenagers wind up in the streets. I mean, there's all kinds of consequences. They can't do as much care uh, uh, work uh, connecting older people with institutions and with one another, and so you get more older people socially isolated and lonely and unhappy. Um, the, you know, the ripple effects are tremendous. Libraries save lives. Rochelle Brogan, a member of the social work team at the Denver Public Library. We save lives with Narcan. We save lives by helping people find shelter, by sitting and listening and being compassionate and, and, and being here for people, being the resource that is free and that is for everybody. Anybody, everybody's welcome to come in here. Nobody's turned away. Listening to Humankind, I'm David Freudberg. Studio recording by Antonio Oliart Rose. Editorial assistance from Jake Kavicki, Kathy Graham, and Ken Rogers. Webmaster Brian K. Johnson. Special thanks to Steve Martin, Matthew Simonson, Corey Jones, Margaret Krauss, Miles Blackwood Robinson, David Cruz, and Tony Buck. Our program is presented by Human Media. To download an audio copy of this program and access other resources, including the astonishing photos of great world libraries, please visit humanmedia.org. That's humanmedia.org. You can also access our other programs and send us an email from our website. And you can purchase a CD copy of this program by phone. Please call 1-800-5-LISTEN. Again, our web address is humanmedia.org. And you can subscribe to our free weekly podcast, Humankind on Public Radio, available at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and elsewhere. This segment, part of our project, Libraries Reimagined, is Humankind program number 277. The executive producer is David Freudberg. This is Humankind. Humankind is produced in association with WGBH Boston and Documentary Educational Resources. This special project is supported by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation and by the Humankind Program Fund. You're listening to Libraries Reimagined, a Humankind special. I'm David Freudberg. For every child who is living above poverty, on average, they have access to 30 or more books in the home, age-appropriate books in the home. So if you're, you know, a three-year-old, 30 or more age-appropriate books for that three-year-old are in the home. If you're living at or below poverty, it's one book for every 300 children. And this inequality, says Brian Bannon, director of the New York City Public Library, can set a child at a lasting disadvantage. Research indicates that exposing young children to books, like reading stories to them before bedtime, can vastly improve their readiness for learning and academic success. I started very young with my children, days old, was reading them baby board books and looking at pictures together. And it, in doing that, it develops the habit 
I think it teaches an appreciation for books and reading. Kelly Linehan, the mother of two young daughters, is director of the Waltham, Massachusetts Public Library outside Boston. Studies show that even prioritizing reading in your own life and demonstrating that to your children also has not the exact same impact, but certainly a direct um, correlation to how important your child considers reading and learning in their future as well. You mean for the child to be observing that you are reading books for your own benefit? Correct. And that they'll sort of want to mirror and copy as their parents do as well. So carving out that time and talking about the importance of books or a story that you're enjoying, for sure. I remember being read to from a very young age. Physician Perry Class practices pediatrics at Bellevue Hospital in New York City. She's a national leader in early literacy. Both my parents were readers and loved to read. Um, my father, in particular, went on reading to us long past the preschool years. My father was still reading aloud to us when I was in sixth and seventh grade, and he read children's books, but he also read a lot of non-children's books. There are all kinds of works of literature that I first encountered being read in my father's voice, and he, he did the accents. People in all cultures love storytelling. It's one of our most human fascinations. Stories fire our imagination, take us on a journey, help us explore our human conflicts. And something very significant happens in the special encounter when a caring adult reads to a young child. Reading aloud is first and foremost about quality time, bringing parents and children together, helping them to have positive, happy moments. Dr. Alan Mendelson is associate professor of pediatrics at New York University Langone Health. What the research has shown is it also brings in language. It brings the opportunity to talk together. It brings the opportunity to have back and forth conversations about um, the things that both parents and children are in in interested in. Uh, what's going on in the world? What are those uh, many things out there, those buildings, those cars, those trucks? Um, what, you know, what, what is it that makes me happy? Um, what, what is it that makes me sad? And um, it's, it's a place, a safe place, where parents and children can engage around, you know, what they really care about. Do you read aloud to your child? Yes, every day, yeah. This is Manuela, who works as an acupuncturist, but finds time to bring her young son frequently to the Waltham Library. We read several books a day. He always gets books before nap and before bedtime. Um, and does he ask for them? Oh yeah, he loves books. He asks for more. We have a two book limit before nap and bedtime, and he often wants more and more, so I have to promise him that the next day we'll read more. But you have to enforce that limit. We do, because he loves them so much. <laughs> They feel loved. They feel a connection with their caregiver who is reading with them. Shauna Rabido is the children's librarian. When you're reading to a child, they're usually sitting on your lap or sitting very close to you. There's no TV, no extra noises. It's usually just like a special, quiet moment. And you're both focused on the same thing and enjoying the same thing. When the story is funny, you're laughing together, or maybe they find something funny and start to laugh, and you're laughing with them. So the whole experience is very special, one-on-one -on -one time, and um, I think that that adds to that experience and to that future love of reading. Rapid brain development in the first five years of life offers a unique opportunity for human growth and language proficiency provides children with essential skills for thought. As compared with speech a child overhears, language spoken directly to children can greatly enhance their capacity to interpret words and understand ideas. Kelly Linehan. It's because they're hearing all these words. You're constantly talking to them and engaging with them. Something that you know we try to do during our story times, and, and even at home reading with my own child is going through the books and, and reading the text on the page, and then following up with a comment like, you know, that bear does look angry. Why do you think he's so angry? Or like, can you see the duck on this page? How many feathers does that duck have? 
stop yelled the lion i am a very hungry lion and my tummy is grumbling uh-oh hey who's that her pet is it a doggy no it's a goat. yeah or is it a goat i think it's a goat you think it's a goat oh. then the three of them gobbled up a whole basket of donuts together the lion had how many did the lion have can you count five you didn't even have to count my fingers. That was very good. Five donuts for the lion. It doesn't even matter Soon what book you're reading, right? Reading the same book over and over again. It just helps their mind expand in so many ways. And I'm always surprised at how the kids make these connections from the books to the play area to their friendships and asking follow-up questions. It's amazing how much they really do absorb. What is great about the asking of questions, whether it's by the parent or the child, it, it supports active learning. Pediatrician Alan Mendelson. Here we are reading a book together and looking at that picture of a ball or the picture of a dog or the picture of a car. And when I, as a child, am asked that question, wow, I really need to think about that. I may or may not have the words yet, and yet nonetheless, um, parts of my brain are lighting up. Those nerve cells are firing. And those nerve cells are saying, yeah, this is something I have to think about. Maybe there's a word I'm going to use. Maybe I have it. Maybe I don't. And active learning is what happens throughout our lives. If I'm, you know, passively sitting at a seminar, I definitely learn things. I, I love to passively sit at a seminar. It's one of my favorite things to do. Um, but, but I will learn the best if I then engage in um, back and forth uh, questions with the person who's leading the seminar during it or even after. Are you conscious of trying to find different words and expose these kids to a variety of vocabulary? Oh, yes, we definitely are. Nancy Ray of the Library Children's Department. Even within the nursery rhymes, you'll find unusual words like Little Miss Muffet sat on her tuffet. Those are words that are unfamiliar in our regular vocabulary. What is a tuffet? <laughs> There's a lot of debate about that, but my interpretation is it's, it's like kind stool. of a hassock of sorts. A little stool, yes. Okay, I just... Yeah, and it might have been a naturally occurring thing that looked like a stool, and they called it a tuffet. Who knows? There's a lot of debate about this. A child's acquisition of language is one of the great wonders of human life. The apparently meaningless sounds babbled by infants and toddlers are how they begin practicing rhythm, volume, and tone in speech. And associating the spoken word with the printed word represents a remarkable leap in the functioning of our brain. We didn't evolve for reading. We evolved for spoken language. Our brains evolved for spoken language. There's never been a human community that didn't have spoken language. But there have been plenty without written languages. Physician and author Perry Class. Written language is something we invented. We kind of jerry-built it. So we use all the visual pathways in our brain because you have to see the letters and pattern recognition. We use memory of various kinds in order to connect with the letters. We use phonological awareness, connecting um, the letters on the page to the sounds so that B makes ba and, and phonemic awareness so that BA makes ba. But we also use vocabulary and we use syntax. And it takes such a lot to get from the marks on the page to meaning that for children to get there, their brains have to basically have been nurtured and have developed properly along multiple trajectories. So it's kind of a remarkable thing that we can do it. I mean, it's, it's visual processing, but it's also cognition. It's memory. It's vocabulary. It's a lot of things all working together. And do all of those events enhance the development of a child's brain? Of course, they absolutely do. But we know that kind of the more you use your brain, the better your brain gets. So 
reading is a, a tremendous exercise for all of those different parts of the brain. But the flip side of this is that children raised with a language deficit may be disadvantaged. It's sometimes called the word gap. They're being read to less and seeing fewer books in the home and hearing a narrower vocabulary spoken around them. Pediatrician Alan Mendelson. To the extent that children have limited exposures to uh, high-quality high uh, language and to the extent that children um, you know, are exposed to uh, highly stressful in environments um, in and outside of their homes, um, that that puts those uh, children um, at risk for not being ready to start school. We call this school readiness, a sort of the jargony term, um, in which they may not know their letters when they start kindergarten. They may not begin to be able to identify uh, words. Um, they may not have the, the patience, the capacity to um, a attend and regulate their behavior and learn when they start school. And this can lead to a um, cascade um, of challenges for those children. So the field of early literacy has adopted popular programs like A Thousand Books Before Kindergarten, which asks parents to develop a regular practice of reading aloud to their children. Librarian Lisa O'Coin. It just encourages reading. It, it can be any book, even though the group has a list of suggested books to help the parents. But if a parent... Um, as is often the case, if a child has a favorite book that they want to read five times a day, that counts five times towards the thousand. And at each hundred books, the kids get a sticker that says, basically, yay, I read another hundred books. And then at a thousand, there's a bunch of prizes to celebrate their exposure to a number of books. So have you encountered families that attain this level oh, of a thousand yes, books? many. It's not hard to do. If you only read one book a day, which of course is not going to just happen. But if you only read one book a day, you'd achieve that goal in three and a half years. And you're saying that most families will read more? Oh yes, definitely. So some families, if they're dedicated and they're reporting, would probably achieve it in a year. But I think a lot of families don't get all their books recorded down on their um, sheets of smiley faces. Exploring the profound benefits of early literacy. You're listening to Humankind. I'm David Freudberg. For more information on this segment, part of our project Libraries Reimagined, and to obtain audio downloads or CDs, please visit humanmedia.org. As we've heard, learning to read at a young age can greatly enhance a child's prospects in academic achievement and beyond. And reading aloud to children, even before they're literate, can promote powerful bonding between parent and child. But there's another important benefit, librarian Richard Ashby near Pittsburgh. The only way to get equity in education is through reading, is through ex exposing our young children to different words. And that's very interesting because once you s start putting the books and the resources into the children's hand before kindergarten, that gives them a great chance at the starting line. Starting line being, f um, used to be first grade. Now the starting line starts way before first grade. Experts in early child development point to the importance of both quantity and quality of words. Young children benefit from hearing lots of different words. Language-rich interactions help to expand their vocabulary. And by age three or four, exposure to narratives, like descriptions of past or future events, or being read vivid stories, helps kids to understand their world. Those young brains are developing very quickly, and children soak up new ideas. I remember as a child, my mother read us a story every night. Do you remember the little golden books? Those were a must. You know, the Aesop fairy tales, Brother Remus, all of those stories, all of those stories, all those different words, words that 
brought books to life. Which helps to close the word gap for children being raised with limited language opportunities, but also to introduce children to the new worlds available through literature. Once you start exposing children to different books about different people, about different um, countries, different cultures, once they get to school and they start meeting different people, they don't seem so strange to them. Because why? Because they have been read to about those cultures, about those people. But if you, you take a child and you just don't expose him to different cultures through books and through reading, when they get to school, when they get in public, they're lost. That's why diverse books are so important in libraries. You know, you just can't, you can't like a black child, you just cannot show a black child a book without seeing themselves in the book, without seeing themselves as doctors, lawyers, engineers. You have to show our children themselves in books and in literature for them to succeed. Not only um, get them a lot of vocabulary words, a plethora of vocabulary words are, is wonderful, but do they see themselves in those words? That's the key. I come here because they have a lot of bilingual programs, and I um, speak. we only speak Spanish at home with my son, so I really love coming to Waltham because they have more bilingual offerings than in other libraries. So that's why I make the trip out here. Where do you go? Oh, there he is. Um, he's absorbing uh, English on his own, and we have a lot of friends that also speak Spanish, so he's able to socialize in Spanish with other children. And um, I immigrated to the U.S. when I was about 21 years ago, and my sister was five. Where, where did you emigrate from? From Venezuela. Um, and when we immigrated, my sister was five years old and only spoke Spanish, and she was put in a you know, kindergarten, and after a few months she was completely fluent in English after only knowing Spanish for five years. So I have no worries with my son that he'll absorb it all in no time. Easy yeah. for them. Yeah. <laughs> We have many patrons that have moved here from other countries that they didn't have access to, to books. They didn't have access to a library. They, many, even school was a difficult thing. So they certainly didn't have books in their homes. Waltham, Massachusetts Children's Librarian, Shauna Rabido. It's a wonderful feeling to know that you're able to give books to people that may never have had that access. I mean, I remember even just about a month ago, helping um, a young boy who was translating for his cousin. And his, he was eight, and he was translating. His cousin spoke only Spanish. And he was like, you can have a book. And his cousin was like, what? What do you mean? You can take this book home. It's free. You can take it home, and then you bring it back. And to see his cousin's face just light up and, and to have that book in his hands and know that he could bring it home and not have to pay anything and just be able to have it at his house, it's, it was incredible. There are other experts weighing in about the advantages of early literacy, economists who focus on the problems of inequality and social mobility. They recognize the huge leg up that children gain from learning to read at a young age. If you were to look at literacy rates in our incarcerated adults, the literacy rate is not much better than third grade in most cases. Arthur Rolnick at the University of Minnesota served as senior vice president at the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. And some cr criminologists will tell you uh, when we look at third grade literacy or lack of literacy, it's a pretty good predictor of how many prisons we're going to need in 10, 15 years from now. When a person is functionally illiterate, they face a host of problems from health risks to low income to high stress to being socially intimidated, all associated with difficulty reading and understanding the written word. Imagine a child is, who is well behind literacy standards by the third grade. On average, they don't catch up, so they stay far behind. Many of them don't graduate high school. What do you do in this economy when you don't graduate high school? 
if this is a problem over the last 50 years, imagine the next 50 years when human capital, education, train job training is so critical to succeed in our economy. And so it shouldn't surprise us that literacy is a key element long term in the success of the child and the success of our community. So that's one way literacy plays in. But I would also argue it's closely correlated with what we call cognitive IQ, which is you could say literacy and emotional IQ. If a child comes into kindergarten and they're having trouble just relaxing, sitting down, interacting with their peers, their executive function is missing or is, is well behind, it's going to be hard for them to catch up on uh, on the literacy and, and the so so words matter, but you got to go deeper than that. We got to make sure we treat the whole child and make that that child is emotionally ready for school as well as cognitively ready for school. Then they're more likely to be literate by the third grade, more likely to graduate high school and be literate, more likely to succeed in life. Which brings us back to the mystery of how we actually develop the skills to understand and to speak and to read words. Physician Perry Class. A bunch of things are going on with young children as they're learning, as they're sort of growing up in what some people have called the language soup around them. There's all kinds of different learning going on. There's um, really interesting mathematical, algebraic learning in which they're figuring out the grammar of the language that they're hearing by processing all of the different kinds of sentence structures coming across the, their, their radar. Um, I mean, nobody completely understands how they do it, but they do it. And these mechanics can make a difference not just in children's mastery of language, but also in how that skill level impacts other areas of their lives. In some ways, it's easier to imagine how the child might hear a particular word, and you might say over and over to the child, um, this is your nose, this is your nose, and then eventually you might start hearing it. But how does the child figure out pronouns, and how does the child figure out verbs? This is sort of going on with exposure, going on with those amazing child brains, picking out frequencies and word relations, and so much of this depends on the processing speed. There have been some really interesting studies looking at socioeconomic disparities, and there are famous socioeconomic disparities in vocabulary size. In some studies that were done at Stanford, there were actually interesting socioeconomic disparities in processing speed as young as, young as um, children who were 18 months and younger. You take a baby, a one-year-old or a 15-month-old, and I'm going to hold up something which the baby knows. I'm going to. We've, we've agreed that the baby knows what is a car, right? If I put the baby in front of pictures and I say, where's the car, where's the car, the baby will look at the picture of the car. The baby knows what a car is. Um, and we can track this because we have these um, amazing, they have, they, the researchers have these amazing little helmets which can follow the baby's gaze. So the question is, I've got, you've got your baby on your lap and I hold up this known object. I hold up two things and I say, where's the car? Where's the car? And then what we're measuring in the processing speed is how quickly the baby looks at the car. So we're measuring the speed with which the word car goes in through the child's ears, goes to the child brain, and the child recognizes it and says, oh, yes, car, over there. And, it tur and so we're, this is happening in nanoseconds, but we can see that the children growing up in more affluent families are faster. And why is that? We think it's because they're hearing more language. Same thing, more stimulation, more practice, more back and forth. But the problem with it is that if every word is taking you a few more nanoseconds to process, then you're losing the words that come right after, right? Here you are. Uh, it, it, it's a, a little bit of a clue to why some of these disparities may get wider and wider, because the kids with the faster processing are hearing the next word much more, more are hearing it sooner and able to start processing it, and the kids who are processing more slowly are at a sort of spiraling disadvantage. So does that support the idea of expose young children to as broad a vocabulary as possible? What it really supports the, is the idea of talk to them, interact with them, and make sure it's not all disciplinary. Does it have to be wildly 
um, diverse vocabulary? I don't know. I mean, I'm I'm in favor of, you know, the more exposure, the more talking, the more story reading, the more singing, the better. Dr. Perry Class is professor of journalism and pediatrics at New York University. She also serves as national medical director of Reach Out and Read, a network of pediatricians who give books to parents of young children to encourage reading and storytelling as a daily activity. Coming up, we turn to adults who may be competent readers, but not necessarily digitally literate, which can matter in this age of false information intentionally disseminated online. When Humankind continues in a moment. How to safeguard ourselves from deliberate efforts to spread false information. You're listening to Humankind. I'm David Freudberg. We live in the age of disinformation, propaganda that's intended to mislead. It takes the form of unfounded rumors, outright hoaxes, and kooky conspiracy theories may reinforce our own fears and biases, but bear little relation to reality. And sometimes it's a highly organized cyber assault. The defendants allegedly conducted what they called information warfare against the United States, with the stated goal of spreading distrust towards the candidates and the political system in general. Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein in February 2018. He detailed a federal indictment charging criminal interference in the 2016 presidential election. The indictment was brought against members of the Internet Research Agency, a shadowy firm with ties to the Kremlin based in St. Petersburg, Russia. Internet Research Agency allegedly operated through Russian shell companies. It employed hundreds of people and arranged into departments, including graphics, search engine optimization, information technology, and finance departments. So with bad actors out there, the average person wonders about a simple question. What information can we trust? And it turns out the answer is a little complicated. Joanna Burkhardt, a librarian at the University of Rhode Island, wrote Protect Yourself from Fake News, a poster published by the American Library Association. It offers tips to help information consumers separate fact from fiction. The amount of fake news that appears to be out there is kind of clogging up our information highway. So I thought it was important to help people understand what they needed to do in order to avoid the fake news and find valid news. Is there a traffic jam on the information highway? Well, there is. The uh, amount of information that's available via the Internet, via social media, is enormous. And it comes at us 24-7 like out of a fire hose. It's very, very difficult to select any information because there's so much of it. Um, So when you consider the... um, the amount of information there is and the amount of time it takes to evaluate information on a regular basis, people often don't have time to really think about selecting the best source they can. So they select the first source that comes up, which is not necessarily true information or valid information or information from an expert. New jobs programs, What do you think are the greatest obstacles to people developing information literacy of the kind that is required in the 21st century? I think the biggest obstacle is speed. Most of the uh, young people, anyway, are used to having things be instantaneous, and they don't really wait They don't want to spend the time that it takes to vet a source or to find out what an author knows about a topic. Information is a slow process. 
and it needs to be slowed down in order to select and use the best information. So I think the speed of how information comes at us and how we send it out again needs is it's a critical problem that needs to be addressed. One wildly popular resource faces an ongoing challenge of evaluating the reliability of information. It's the free online encyclopedia known as Wikipedia. It's viewed more than 20 billion times a month. It has published 50 million articles and works with over 250,000 editors. Wikipedia is operated by the nonprofit Wikimedia Foundation based in San Francisco. Catherine Marr is the CEO. We always encourage people to be critical readers. It doesn't mean that Wikipedia is 100% accurate, uh, but we always say, you know, you should check the citations. You should read with a critical eye. You should ask yourself, where does this information come from and why is it here? And that's not just a skill for Wikipedia. That's actually a skill for life. You know, it's the case that even our most trusted sort of media institutions and um, publications of high repute sometimes get it wrong. They issue corrections. They issue second editions with updated, you know, forwards. It it's the case that knowledge is constantly in flux and constantly being built and developed. Our understanding of the world from a scientific perspective is perpetually evolving from a medical perspective, uh, from a historical perspective, as we look at who has been accounted for and who has been left out. So we encourage uh, that everybody you know, starts from the basis of saying, you know, this information is probably pretty good, but what, what do I need to be aware of when I, when I read through? And you can start to, to distinguish relatively quickly when something has is incomplete or is potentially biased. You can look at the quality of uh, you know, how many adjectives are used to describe something. Are more adjectives better or worse? Well, in Wikipedia, what we often look at is when people use superlatives to describe issues, very frequently that indicates that sort of a lack of neutrality relative to the quality of the article overall. So I'm talking to you from San Francisco. If the Wikipedia article were to say San Francisco is the best city in California, we would say, that, well, that's not really neutral. So what are the what are the facts that would underlie that assertion? And so sometimes when we're looking at the quality of an article, what we're often looking it is what are the words that people are using to describe the circumstances versus the evidence that they're able to bring in in order to support that assertion. So when we look at what constitutes a reliable source for Wikipedia, we say, well, what's the process of review that it goes through? Is there peer review? Is there some sort of editorial process? Is this a source that issues corrections. If it gets things wrong, does it follow up and do that due diligence and have that cycle of accountability with its readers? Uh, is it respected in its field? Does Is this something that has uh, garnered widespread support within sort of the sector which it represents? And as we look at all those different factors, that starts to provide more of a map as to how you might evaluate information, where it comes from, who's publishing it, and in whose interest is it that it is being distributed. And does Wikipedia use some algorithm that evaluates that? So we are experimenting with whether we can start to assign credibility to sources. It is possible to start modeling what that might look like using uh, machine learning algorithms that say that, for example, can look at the frequency of citations back to a journal article. So there is a way in which academics assess the influence of a paper that has been published by looking at how many other papers cite that paper. So if you write a paper A and then there are are a hundred papers that reference paper A, that is considered a more influential paper than if only 10 papers reference it. Catherine is quick to point out that because something has been widely cited doesn't confirm its accuracy. It may be trendy just because it's interesting or that it happens to be newsworthy at a particular moment or that it's exciting. If the article remains popular over time, she says, that may indicate its lasting impact. But when we look something up online, there's another potential pitfall, says librarian Joanna Burkhart. 
we tend to get caught up into our own little information bubbles, especially with predictive searching, so that we only get information that uh, it reinforces what we already know and like. What is predictive searching? Predictive searching is like what happens on Netflix. You you watch this particular program, so we're going to select 12 more programs in that same genre that you might like. So it's not a search that you initiate. It is suggestions made by the vendor. Yes, and it happens in in Google searching. It happens when you go to Amazon to pick a book or a sweater or whatever it happens to be. There's all this predictive searching. So to promote products, some websites feed us a menu of options we might like. Different users, based on their individual history, which is tracked, may get a customized menu. But the effect of this is to highlight certain options and to exclude others. And that may cause us to narrow our sense of what's possible. The predictive searching puts us into an information bubble where eventually we start to think that there isn't anything else out there, that everybody agrees with what we agree with, everybody buys what we buy, everybody likes the books that we like, and we forget that there are other things outside this predictive bubble. And when it comes to search engines like Google, a particular search result may index the Internet's content in a manner that skews according to a particular viewpoint, but doesn't reflect what might be regarded as unbiased information. We can't really know what what criteria it's using to collect those sites and put. So that's the first step: is that the information that you get on the first page, which is the only information you're going to look at, is we don't know where it came from. We don't know how it came to us. We don't know why it's at the top of the list, and it's not necessarily because it's the best information. If you're using your home computer. Google already knows the stuff that you like and what you look for on a regular basis, and that's different from what I would look for. So our results are going to be different as well. Thus, being a savvy consumer of digital information means keeping in mind that the disseminators operate with an agenda and often an elaborate business structure that may distort the content you receive. Again, University of Rhode Island librarian Joanna Burkhart. To know who is providing the information. And if you don't know who's providing the information, to find out. To fact check the information that you're receiving to make sure that it is reliable. And there are lots of fact checking sites available that will help you do that. Can you recommend a couple? Uh, Snopes is one that I, snopes.com. And uh, factcheck.org is another. Um, there, there are multiple fact-checking organizations out there. And how reliable are they? They're really pretty good. Um, Snopes is m- my go-to site, and they will show you when the information first appeared, and they will cite uh, other sources of information that will either confirm the, the original piece or they will um, refute it. We're examining the challenge of digital literacy at a time when the velocity of information bombarding us requires careful attention to the skills of critical thinking. You're listening to Humankind. I'm David Freudberg. For more information on this segment, part of our project Libraries Reimagined, and to obtain audio downloads or CDs, please visit humanmedia.org. The Digital Public Library of America is an extraordinary project founded in 2010 with the expectation that more and more knowledge will be produced, shared, and consumed digitally. It connects libraries, museums, and civic institutions around the United States. The DPLA is an online network with a combined collection containing more than 36 million items. This includes over 6,000 free ebook titles. The executive director is John Bracken. 
around the time that we were founded as an organization, I, in my previous job, gave an award on behalf of a journalism organization to one of the co-founders of Twitter for the role of Twitter in the Arab Spring. We were celebrating as a society these, you know, you, you saw the, the marchers in Cairo holding up signs that said Facebook. Social media and these, the digital possibilities of these amazing platforms that it, were emerging out was part of this set of dialogue we were having about people's revolutions and overthrowing authoritarianism and connecting people to people across the world in whole new ways. Yet in the decades since, that authentic optimism has been dampened. Advocates of a utopia of freely flowing knowledge have been chastened by the emergence of trends like cyberbullying and internet addiction and Russian use of social media to twist American presidential elections. We're having a much different set of conversations, right? We're looking at and thinking very critically. At the headline every day is about the ways in which these tools have actively been weaponized to undermine democracy. That doesn't mean that the possibilities and the excitement we had about what digital could enable for humankind were wrong. But it suggests that this technology has come on so rapidly and so forcefully that it may have outpaced the development of our personal skills to handle it. And make no mistake, these new tools do require fresh approaches to managing the torrent of information coursing into our lives. The lessons that a lot of us have taken away, and this is where I think libraries are just so key in what we're trying to help germinate with the Digital Public Library of America, is taking the resources and the professional practices that we have honed over decades and centuries in the curation of information, in the uh, creating a space for people to come and engage with knowledge in ways appropriate for where they are, um, and for helping to promote dialogue about the state of society, that those practices that libraries and librarians have developed are more important than ever now as we try to figure this all out. One thing I've wondered about is the effects of online education, especially for young learners. When the coronavirus pandemic surfaced and schools across the United States suspended classes, many shifted to virtual learning. But does something get sacrificed when face-to-face -face engagement between teacher and student is replaced? We know that the values of each are different and complementary, and we don't need to live in an either-or world. Again, John Bracken. I say that partly as a parent of a, a, a nine-and-a-half-year-old who's an, a passionate reader and both loves to engage with digital materials and digital text and lo you know, has a stuffed backpack full of six or seven hardcover books because she loves books. And young people coming of age today will have to wrestle with all the complexities and conflicts of the digital age they've been born into. But I still remain you know, fundamentally optimistic that these are a set of tools that if we use the right way and in the right context, are going to unleash greater creativity and spread knowledge more, more than we would have had. I mean, the, the possibilities inherent in digital are still so important and so huge that often I think we're at a moment in time where we're focusing on the negative to the point where we're losing track of what the potentials are. What seems certain is that digital technologies are here to stay. The impact of the cyber revolution in recent decades is far-reaching and for all its benefits, also carries unintended consequences. And says John Bracken of the Digital Public Library of America, the stakes are high. I think it's important to recognize that we're living in odd times, that we're actually having, on a fairly regular routine basis, conversations about, you know, will the American experiment with democracy survive? Um, you know, that, that, has, that doesn't happen with a great regularity over the course of American history. Um, and I think that this set of civic institutions that we have, that again, that are distributed across the U.S., that are in every neighborhood in the U.S., that are staffed by professionals who are trained in uh, the provision of information that people need, um, and, and that these spaces are designed to be open for anyone to engage with. I do think that's such a valuable resource at this time of distrust, of discord, of disintermediation.
When infections from the COVID-19 coronavirus began to multiply in early 2020, the Internet allowed public libraries to remain accessible. Their physical doors were generally shuttered to protect the public, but their websites were humming, a way for patrons cooped up at home to retrieve a wealth of online resources, from popular magazines to movies to electronic books. It's a reminder of the function of public libraries in our communities. Catherine Marr of Wikipedia. If we have an institution that is trusted, already it has an advantage in terms of being a guide or helping us navigate the information landscape. What I think that the role of libraries can be is really around having conversations with communities, not about what to think, but about how to think and how to navigate what information is put in front of us. Libraries are not going to solve the challenges of social media proliferation of misinformation. They are not going to solve the challenges of uh, public figures providing bad information. What they can do is that they can work within their communities to offer ways to encourage people to think critically because they already start from a position of trust. People will walk in and understand that a library is not there to tell them what to think. It's there to work to, to support them in how they learn to think. Which includes media literacy skills. Brian Bannon directs the New York City Public Library and is president of the Digital Public Library of America. The libraries play a role, and we are playing a role, in helping people better understand um, how they're getting information, where they get their information, how to evaluate whether or not the source is a reliable one. And if they're doing, you know, if they're getting a large part of their information in, you know, these new social media environments, not new some more, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, these other places, how do we help them better detect uh, when the likelihood of the information they're getting or the source of information that they're getting is, is, isn't, isn't a good one. The age-old proverb, let the buyer beware, applies not just to the retail environment, but to our digital lives as well. We're all vulnerable to con artists, now armed with powerful new tools of fabrication. This idea of media literacy isn't a new one. Um, uh, it perhaps is more important today, given the fact that we're getting our information from lots of different sources, and there's a, there's a, there's a less of a curated process of, of fact-checking. But it's been an important element of our democracy for a long time, and we have an important role to play. Librarians have an incredibly important curatorial role in terms of putting forward information that challenges us and asks us to look at differing perspectives. Catherine Marr. I think that the ability of a library to put the information that, that asks us to go beyond sort of the superficial discourse of the day uh, by putting longer form resources in front of people, by putting competing ideas in terms of the, the book selections that are, are being displayed to the public or the information selections. Th these are all ways in which librarians ask us to sort of challenge what it is that we think about when we go um, in, into a library or into a space. By seeing the variety of works available, patrons may discover new ideas to consider. Traditionally, libraries offer these selections while respecting the right of individuals to make their own decisions privately. And Catherine Marr tries to carry that principle into her work at Wikipedia. I'm actually from the state of Connecticut, and, and I'm always very proud uh, to be from the state of Connecticut because it was the Connecticut state librarians who were the first to challenge um, something known as a national security letter. In the aftermath of 9-11, the U.S. government was issuing these national security letters. They were asking libraries to share information about what their patrons were looking up. And when these national security letters were issued, they were issued within a presumptive gag order. So as soon as you received one, you couldn't disclose that you had received it, not even in theory, to your own lawyers. Well, the Connecticut State Librarians were the first to publicly and successfully challenge the national security letter practice. And in fact, the result of that was, was that the practice of using that was dropped. It was no longer considered a viable instrument. You know, that's the lengths to which librarians go to protect the freedom of inquiry of individuals. Well, the moral of that story is clearly don't tangle with Connecticut librarians. Well, I think just don't tangle with librarians, period. listening to Humankind. I'm David Freudberg. Studio recording by Antonio.
Antonio Oliart Rose. Editorial assistance from Jake Kavicki, Kathy Graham, and Ken Rogers. Webmaster Brian K. Johnson. Special thanks to Doug Sugart, Steve Martin, Laura Carlo, David Cruz, Miles Blackwood Robinson, and Tony Buck. Our program is presented by Human Media. To download an audio copy of this program and access other resources, please visit humanmedia.org. That's humanmedia.org. You can also access our other programs and send us an email from our website. And you can purchase a CD copy of this program by phone. Please call 1-800-5-LISTEN. Again, our web address is humanmedia.org. And you can subscribe to our free weekly podcast, Humankind on Public Radio. This segment, part of our project Libraries Reimagined, is Humankind program number 279. The executive producer is David Freudberg. This is Humankind.